Jackie Barrett. I am an ultra marathon runner. I am a plant-based athlete. I am also a research scientist. I do brain research and stroke survivors. And I'm on the panel tonight. My name is Vince Roundtree and I am a health coach. I work with people that have high blood pressure, type two diabetes, high cholesterol, people that are at risk of heart attack or stroke, and I help them to change the way they eat from eating the standard American diet to eating unprocessed plant-based foods. And when they do that, their cholesterol drops, their blood pressure drops, their blood glucose levels drop, and into the normal range for many people, and I'm able to help people to get off of medication. It is a pleasure to speak here at the All Three uh, Sporting Show as a panelist. Hey, I'm Nicole D'Andrea. I'm a registered dietitian and um, I blog and write and share nutrition tips and recipes on purelyplanted.com. Um, so how many of you are already whole food, plant-based? Um, okay. Thank you. We just wanted to have some idea. Mm -hmm. How many of you um, just new to this idea, just very curious, want to find out more about it? Explain. Explain. <laughs> how, how many of you are uh, endurance athletes who are interested in the performance on that side? Okay, great. Well, thank you. Awesome. Just wanted to have some idea. Awesome. That is great. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, this is all individual based. I just wanted to say. I want you to just take on all the information that you can learn today and um, apply to, to yourself. If you have any medical conditions and you're, if you're taking any medications, you know, please consult with the doctor. Um, don't jump right in, because I know some triathletes personalities. <laughs> got this. I'm gonna just start today or tomorrow, um, but you know, make sure you check on, you know, um, check those things with the doctor if you have a certain condition. But uh, we have a pack full of great information. You probably can hear some of those um, benefits of whole food, plant-based. Um, so we're gonna get right in. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is we prepare a, um, a common questions that most people um, ask to a vegan person or a plant-based person, so we prepare some of those common questions. So um, first part of that, we're just going to ask our panel of speakers those questions, and then later on we want to open up to everybody for um, QAs, any questions you may have. So Sounds good. So I'd say, first of all, people at the back, can you hear okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And then also, those speakers don't forget it. we have people in the back, so it'd be Okay. That's Maybe never that. been a problem for me. <laughs> never. Especially with <laughs> Maybe didn't sit right there, so it's like, oh, exactly. Water. Exactly. <laughs> but I also just want to make a note before we start. I think it's it's really cool to have such a well balanced panel because if you think about it, we have a registered dietitian who has the, the experience from the scientific perspective and went to school specifically for that in order to get educated in the area of nutrition. We have a person who is specifically well-versed from the behavioral perspective and is behavioral coach and can deal with, okay, I know, I know what to do, but then how I do it, how does it translate to the day-to-day -day basis, on top of all the other plant-based experience that Vince has. And we have a just extremely educated PhD DPT Jackie Merritt, who is also a bright example that not only is possible in theory, but it's possible in practice. And she proves that with her experience and all of her achievements in the ultra running and, and the world of endurance uh, sports in general. So just keep that in mind that, again, like we, our main goal here is not brainwashing or any kind of propaganda. We're really here to talk about facts and evidence and people's experience of what's out there. And we hope to have a respectful discussion and we we'll welcome any kind of questions and concerns you have. So we'll make sure, as Izumi said, to, to leave room uh, for your questions as well. But we do have somewhat of a good outline. We did ask mm -hmm. for some questions ahead of time. So we had people submit the questions and we, we, we think we'll cover some of those. Yeah. Okay. All right, the very first question I'm going to ask, you may guess. <laughs> How do you get protein? <laughs> okay, so maybe Nicole, you 
can start? Sure. I think there. Um, I mean, that is the most common question. And for those of you that follow plant-based, just I mean, it's it's it is laughable because it, I think that you know protein is found in foods that cows eat in plants, um, and you know there's so many large animals that eat plants and they grow fine and they get the same protein from the plants. So the same is for us. I mean, you know, we can get protein in any type of plant foods, but like the high sources of protein, of course, are gonna be your legumes, your beans, lentils, like 18 grams per cup. Um, so of course, like soy products, and we can talk about that later too, because there's always like debunking the myths of soy. Soy good for you or bad for you is probably the most polarizing food on the planet. Um, but soy products, are, of course, are a great source of protein. Um, nuts and seeds. Um, and then just like oatmeal, whole grains, amaranth is a whole grain that has got eight grams of protein per cup. So like, I think a lot of times we don't think about like breads and whole grains, like whole grain breads, not processed white bread, but, um, and you know, things that other things like oats have protein that you just don't think about that stuff that you're adding every day to your diet. I recently did a blog that it was a 2000 calorie diet. I just looked at a plant-based diet using whole foods, like oatmeal in the morning, um, added maybe some hemp seeds and chia seeds to the oatmeal, a black bean burger, and then at night it was like a tofu stir fry. And I want to say it was like nine, it was close to 100 grams of protein on a 2,000 calorie diet, which is plenty. Um, most people, endurance athletes are different. Most people need about uh, the RDA is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram, which for like you know 150, 150 person, 150 pound person it's gonna be maybe like 60 to 70 grams of protein a day is what's needed just for most people. Um, of course, endurance athletes are gonna need more like 1.2 to 2 grams of protein, but even that, you know, if you need 120 to 150 grams of protein a day, you really can do it through plants. On a 2,000 calorie diet, that diet that I analyzed was 100 grams of protein. Endurance athletes need more calories, so it's gonna be easier to get more protein. Um, so yeah, do you guys, do you two have anything to add? How about Jackie? Because you do endurance, yeah. uh, you know, long run. Okay, so last year, um, so last year, I, last, I think it was about a little over a year ago, I was pregnant with um, my daughter, and um, I was under midwife care, and um, I have never been really very concerned about the whole protein thing. Um, I guess reading the China study, which if you haven't read the China study, it's um, I highly recommend it, but it's a very kind of scientific, evidence-based perspective of um, the benefits of a plant-based diet from a health-oriented perspective. And um, reading that book and then uh, reading some other resources really kind of debunked this myth of that it's hard to get protein. So I never really found it challenging to get protein. But anyway, last year, my midwives were concerned that I might not be getting enough protein because I'm vegan. And so, um, they asked me, they gave me a food log, and they asked me, well, log your food and everything you're eating over the course of three days because we just want to see, because they were telling me this, like, you know, you need to start eating, like, three scoops of protein powder with every meal and all of this stuff, which I never even eat protein powder, so, and I, because I really don't even like the taste of it, so I was like, I really don't want to do this, so I'll do this, like, diet log thing, which I never really do. But in the first day, without even trying, just eating what I normally ate, I ate 96 grams of protein without trying. Wow. And that was with being like feeling sick and like not even eating as many calories as I normally would as an athlete, because I was you know not running as many miles when I was pregnant. So that for me just was like very, um, I don't know. It was it was there was a moment because I was just like this is just my baseline without even having to go out of my way. Um, and I mean, I was logging all of the calories, macros, proteins, carbs, and um, like you're saying, there is, you know, your normal sources of plant-based protein, like I eat beans, I eat nuts and seeds and all of that, but stuff like brown rice, that has like four mm -hmm. grams of protein in one serving, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like bread, that has protein in it, like everything, there's a lot of things that have protein in it. So from my view, it's kind of like, unless you're, have a very restrictive caloric diet or you're very restrictive in like the variety of foods, like I'm only eating romaine lettuce or something like that, um, protein just really isn't an issue. Um, and as an athlete, I really look at this more from, I've never counted or monitored my macros and by macros I mean carbs, protein, and fat. Like that's normally how most diets look and like 
group foods um, together and determine how much you're allowed to have of each. I look at it from like a micronutrient um, perspective. Like I really feel like I want more iron and whatever because of like my train different training loads and that type of thing. So I look at it more in terms of that rather than the macros because I know the macros are just gonna go with it. Um, and it's not really something that you have to worry about. You really don't. So anyway, it ended up not being a problem. I brought back my food logs to the midwife and she was like, okay, um, so you don't need to take any more protein because we were gonna, we really, we wanted to get you to 70 grams of protein. <laughs> on the first day you're at 96, on the second day you're at 104, and this is like, yeah, so um, yeah, that's my kind of take up. And I'll just add the downside of too much protein is you force your kidneys to have to get rid of it because you can't absorb it. So you put an added load on your kidneys. Most Americans, the kidney function as, the, as they age goes down, down, down a little bit at a time. Just like most Americans over time, their blood pressure goes up, 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 a little bit at a time. And so if you consume all of this extra protein that you can't absorb, you're forcing your kidney to get rid of it. And that's putting an added load on your kidney that it doesn't need and it, it degrades the performance over time. So there is a almost negative side of it, eating of, too much. That's, that's exactly protein. right. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. So now that is out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> you want to ask them the uh, next questions? Yeah. Well, maybe it, we'll we'll jump around a little bit with our plan, but yeah. because I'm sure a lot of people are curious, and I see a few people who submitted the questions maybe also curious about that question. Mm -hmm. Is now now that we know that we're going to be okay with protein. <laughs> <laughs> What, so what is it that you eat? Like, how, what is it, like, what does your overall general meal plan look like? And I know some of the people that are here asking specific in term, and that by that I mean like just hammering intervals on the track or hills or something. Um, then you actually need calories. But most of my runs, just because of the time of day I do it for the most part, um, I just go right out the door. So I go for my run. I might run for in the morning for an hour to two and then come back and I eat breakfast immediately um, because you've got this, what they call like the window, the window. of- 30 um, minutes window. Where, yeah, and really that window, a lot of people think it's protein. It's not, it's actually carbohydrate that you're more sensitive to. Your muscles are more sensitive to the reuptake of glycogen. Your muscles have, have basically been, they've used the glycogen or some of it in the run that you just did, the workout, whatever it was. Um, and now they're trying to load it back on. Um, and so there's a window of about 20 to 30 minutes where um, they want that glycogen um, and then they become less sensitive to it, which doesn't mean that you can't recover, it's just a little more difficult. So I try to eat within that window. And really carbohydrate um, is the most important thing um, in that window. So like I personally like making a smoothie um, and so my smoothie, some people think this is a strange combination, but I usually do like kale or spinach or some type of green. Um, and then I do a banana. Um, I do whatever berry um, that I have or potentially mango. Um, I do a scoop of fl ground flaxseed, a scoop of chia seed, a scoop of um, peanut butter, and then a little bit of, usually I use the ripple pea protein milk. Um, and then I blend all that up. And sometimes they even put coffee in there, which gives it a little bit of like a, a pickup mm -hmm. after drink. Um, so I, I personally really love that smoothie. Um, that's been like my go-to like after workout smoothie. Um, but uh, if you are an athlete and you drink smoothies, you know that you're hungry about an hour after you have a smoothie. So then I always pack some type of snack. So I really like packing like little bags of um, like raw almonds and like raisins or actually dried cherries. I love those like dried tart cherries that don't have the added sugar um, that you can get them in like bulk at Sprouts. Um, I really love those because those actually, um, a lot of the athletes will know about like the properties of cherries that um, help with muscle recovery and um, boost the like anti-inflammation type of processes that happen during recovery in your muscles. So, um, or accelerate them rather. So I like adding those. Um, and then for lunch, I love doing like a huge salad grain bowl. And usually I'll do like a quinoa and kale, or I'll do like quinoa and something, or I'll do brown rice and spinach, or 
something, some grain, maybe farro and kale, and I'll throw like a bunch of nuts and seeds and maybe tofu and maybe edamame and usually beans in there. Really whatever we have, um, I can make a salad out of it. And I love, if you haven't discovered tahini and it's magical uses across like every meal, um, it, it's, it's amazing. I, I mix tahini and lemon juice and maybe a little maple syrup and it makes like an amazing salad dressing and you get more iron and protein and I think you need more of it, but it has all of that in there. So I use that as a salad dressing or I'll even use hummus as a salad dressing. Um, so I'll do that. Uh, snacks, I do like celery, peanut butter, um, apples, like fruits, that type of thing, nuts, seeds, all of that. Um, sometimes I'll even just at work, I'll have like a glass of water and I carry water around with me everywhere and I'll just dump like a spoonful of cheese seeds in there and it gives it like a little crunchy mm. drink. I don't know, it's a little strange, um, but if you like <laughs> chia and like the texture, it can be like really good and it kind of like satiates you a little bit um, between meals. Mm. And then um, after that, I might, like back when I was training for 100 milers um, pre-baby, I would um, usually do a second run or a second workout in the day. And before that, I would do some type of snack before that. Um, I really liked like dates and nut butter. If you haven't tried that, that is amazing. It feels like sinfully good. Like I shouldn't be eating this, but it's literally like a whole fruit and nut butter. And how could this be this good? Um, but uh, I'll do something like that and then I'll go do my run workout and then for dinner um, it could really be anything usually it's out of like minimalist bigger blog or um, thug kitchen we've been loving that um, or uh, oh, what are other oh, uh, how not to die we, we recently got that book um, a few oh, months yeah. ago so yeah. pretty much anything out of there um, you know, in terms of, we do a lot of Mexican themed stuff, uh, Indian, Thai, like anything, you guys know all the possibilities there. So that's my, what my standard day would look like. So, um, yeah. so for those who don't know what tahini is, it's a sesame paste um, that's also in a hummus. So it's one of the ingredients. Yeah, I love that too. Yeah, you yeah. can put that on dates too. It's, yeah. Dates, yeah. it's delicious. I love vegetable, vegetable dates and anything dates is amazing. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. vegetable dates are like ridiculous. It's dates like has yeah, you have to get the visual ones. Vegetable yeah, dates, yeah. they're ridiculous. Are the best. And I push the almonds into the hole, and that's my snack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's a good. That's a good yeah. Yeah. That and then good. I can carry the ziploc bag. <laughs> Yeah. The other thing with tahini is that it's so versatile. Like you can yes. make it into a sweet treat, or like for athletes, something that like you could just make like little nutrition bars that for on the go, or like mm -hmm. during endurance training. Mm -hmm. um, and it can also be savory, as, as Jackie mentioned. That you know you can make it into a salad dressing or a sauce. Make a big jug of it, and you have something to go for the rest of the week, either in your salads or like a cream bowl. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely if you haven't tried it. Took me way too long to discover tahini. Yeah. Way too long. <laughs> Go back it was years here. into my plant-based journey when I started using it regularly. I mean, I use hummus, but tahini, yeah. Nicole, yeah. yeah. from the perspective of the registered dietitian, what are some of the things that uh, people should look out for if they're maybe just fresh transitioning to their plant-based diet or incorporating more plants? So mm -hmm. obviously Jackie already has it down, which has 100 yeah. grams of protein with whole food plant-based without it with protein powder. Yeah. But for somebody who may be concerned that they really want to do it right and then maybe need to put a little bit more thought about it, mm -hmm. what are some of the kind of main pillars that they should put, pay attention to? Well, I think we covered the protein. We know that that's pretty easy. But I think a simple thing to do um, is I like Matt Frazier, the No Meat Athlete, if anybody's familiar with that. His formula of um, grains, greens, and be beans, or grains, beans, and beans. It's basically pre making, I'm a, I'm a big fan of just like making a big thing of whole grains and maybe experimenting with different whole grains. It could be farro, quinoa, um, wheat berries, buckwheat, whatever it is. They, they all have different really amazing nutty flavors, just different flavors, and they all bring their own nutritional value. Um, but maybe choosing one or two grains for the week, making a big batch on a Sunday or whatever day you have time, like an hour or two to make a big batch of that. Um, keeping some pro couple proteins on hand, so whether it's black beans, lentils, whatever your protein is of choice, tofu, um, nuts and seeds, and um, maybe, maybe making some black bean burgers. Um, and then just having a, you know, a handful of vegetables. I think if you just have everything already prepared that you can easily make a bowl, so finding like a nice tahini sauce or recipe or a miso, a miso sauce, making a batch of that, you just have something to go where you can mix and match grains and different use different veggies 
and maybe add a different protein and a different sauce for the week. And I feel like you have a formula there that can, you can just build a meal so easily and you have just a variety of foods. Um, the other thing I think is to always shoot, a lot of people get so focused on numbers and calories and carbohydrate and protein. And as Jackie mentioned, instead of fixating on numbers, it, look at like just the whole foods. And I think it's just more important to look at the colors, like shoot for three or four colors per meal in plants and not like red meat color, but like <laughs> um, beets red meat color, you know, like a purple, a red, an orange, greens, um, grains can count as a color, um, but just like shooting for at least three colors and you're gonna have a nice variety of not just like your macronutrients, but also you're gonna get so many, all those colors that are found in the plants are lending thousands of phytonutrients, phyto meaning plants, phytonutrients that we can't get in animal-based products. And these are the things that are helping us heal with cardiovascular disease and cancer and lowering our blood pressure. Um, so the more color and the more variety you have in your diet, the better you're gonna be. So experimenting, going to the farmer's market, trying something new. Right now, they're, they're, um, I noticed this morning, they have watermelon, purple watermelon radish shell, and it's beautiful. And like instead of um, chips and hummus, try slicing some watermelon radish and using that for your chip. And it's, it has the same nice crunchy flavor and it's got a delicious flavor and it's like power packed with nutrients. Um, so just, yeah, like kind of experimenting with different foods, maybe find one or two recipes as well um, from Minimal's Baker or um, Oshi Glows. Um, there's plenty of just so many reasons. I've got some recipe books I can share with y'all after a week that you're gonna try. And again, just like dedicating one or two hours, whatever day you have time to pre-planning, food shopping, making what you can for that recipe so that when you're coming home, it's kind of ready to go and you don't have to, you know, spend your whole night making a, a new meal. So it's not, you know, laborious for you. It's more fun to experiment. Isabel, I'm going to take one more and I'm going to pass it to you. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. But then transfer it from Nicole to Vince. Mm -hmm. So you work with a lot of people, with groups of people who are not trying, now trying fun-based diet for the first time. What do you see that people struggle with most, or what, what, what are the, like, the biggest barriers they're most concerned about, or what do you see that they, they need help? So I, I would say the biggest struggle for most people is, is, is socially. Um, mm -hmm. If you're in a household, and a lot of times I'll have a wife who's the client and her husband is like, well, I'm not going to give it up. So I'm like, can I talk to him? So sometimes I talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Have you seen Game Changers right there? Yeah. Yes. There's a scene at the end that is really <laughs> powerful. I mean, yes. You know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, if you don't know what, does, it, does anybody here that not know the scene of Game Changers I'm talking about? I don't think it is. Okay. How many of you have not seen Game Changer yet? Oh, okay, so plenty of people. Okay, well, you need to watch right. it, especially you know. Are there, I'll be real. Are there, are, there, are there any kids? Is there anybody in here less than 18? Are there any kids in here? Good. All right, so there's a scene in Game Changers that talks about the male's, you know, thing, right? And so um, they just do a test. They, they, they feed these athletes a burrito that has, uh, you know, there's three different burritos. They did, they did a beef, a chicken, and a pork. Versus, they had that one night, three different athletes, and the next night they had like bean burritos. And they means, yeah. put something, you know, they put this device around the penis to measure the quality of their erection. And it was night and day. The days that they had, uh, the, the, you know, the plant base, they had, they had a, bigger erections and for longer periods of time in their sleep. And, and as a matter of fact, the film crew that filmed it after they, they went plant-based immediately. <laughs> and as a health coach, like I help people, and I've had I've had male clients say, Vince, man, why didn't you tell me? And uh, you know, and it that that happens. But but the area, man, I go off on these tangents. But the, <laughs> I don't know if that's all right or not. But um, the area that most people struggle with is the fact is if you have a, a, a either one of the spouse that wants to do it. Usually it's the woman that wants to do it and the, and the man says he's not gonna change. Uh, and when that happens, I tell the wife, you, don't push. The quality, your relationship is more important than anything. Don't push. He's gotta find his own path. So number one, you just be the shining example of what somebody plant-based is. Um, expose them to your food. A lot of times he will eat your food, you know, when you, when you, when you cook it. Um, and, just love, and just show love and just let, let them find their own path. 
Um, so all this socially, you know, you get invited to weddings, you know, you got corporate lunches that are at Ruth's Chris or something. Actually, Ruth's Chris is not bad, I mean, because you can do the veggies. I've given speeches there. Um, but Fat Max Rib Shack, right? You could go there, what are you gonna eat there, right? I mean, <laughs> white bread and ribs, right? So, um, uh, but socially is the, is, the, is, is the biggest thing. And um, ar around that, you know, what I normally will tell people is to be as defensive as possible. Don't be often, don't go in there saying, I'm gonna change somebody's world. If I run into somebody, if, if when you run into somebody and they say, oh, you're trying that plant-based thing, or you're trying that vegan thing, so, you know, it's not gonna work. So, so then what I tell my clients to tell people, is tell them, yeah, it may not work, but um, I figured I'd give it a try. Now you just took all the bullets out of their gun, right? Ah, oh, it may not work, but I'm, I'm just trying it anyway. I mean, I don't know what's gonna happen. Now they can't fight back, right? Because you're not, and that's just, this like a jujitsu thing, right? I mean, you know, you, you know, you, 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 you pull back and say, you know, it may not work. But um, I would say socially is the biggest thing. Um, mostly by the time people pay me to help them make the transition, they've already, already made the decision for the most part, because my job is to get them to change their identity. People think it takes willpower. And in the beginning it does. I mean, I loved bacon and eggs before I made the change. I mean, I had bacon, I could have bacon and eggs for breakfast, lunch, dinner. I mean, I love bacon. It's probably why my cholesterol is so high, but I love <laughs> bacon and eggs. And so, um, uh, in the beginning, it's just smelling bacon and eggs. I really, really wanted it. And so in the beginning, it takes willpower. But over time, your identity changes. Now, what do I mean by identity changes? What you think you are, right? If you are a runner, you are a runner, right? That is your identity, right? You are a runner. That's your identity. I'm plant-based. That is my identity. I don't want bacon and eggs anymore. So my goal as a coach, as, as a health coach, is to get people to change their identity, then it doesn't require willpower. And the best way to describe that is two different scenarios. Take somebody, take two different people that are quitting smoking, and you ask one person, hey, um, uh, uh, Vince, do you, do, you want a, do you want a cigarette? You say, no, I'm, I'm trying to quit. Okay, another scenario, I'm quitting smoking, and somebody says, Vince, you want a cigarette? I says, no, I'm not a smoker. That's two very different. I said, I'm not a smoker. My identity is not a smoker. So my, my goal is to eventually get my client's identity to be, I don't eat that. So that's the, that's the, big, the biggest challenge is, is, and normally the way I help get is, is I can get them uh, results pretty quick. You know, if I can get you, if I, I mean, I've seen some people have to come off their blood pressure medicine in a, less than a week. And so then it's like, oh my God, I'm losing weight and I'm not needing my pills anymore and the food tastes good. So now I'm getting them some results. Can I say one thing real quick about that? Just to, yeah. just, um, to piggyback on that uh, for a second. Based on the husband wife scenario, my husband's in the back, he can attest to this. When I first went vegan, I, the first week I was like, up? I'm sorry. Um, when, I, when I first decided to go plant-based, um, speaking about the husband-wife scenario, and I cooked my first plant-based meal, my husband was like, I can't do it, like, we can't do this if this is how it's gonna taste. He was just, it was not edible at all. And um, I tried experimenting, because I was like, I know how to cook, I ate, you know, I used to cook chicken and everything, the, you know, meat-based products, so going, even, I mean, they don't teach you this in dietitian school, so I had to really invest in a couple of cookbooks. I like literally could not get. I tried to do it, wing it for two weeks, and it wasn't working. So I invested in some cookbooks and got some recipes online. And then you just kind of get the hang of it. And um, at Vince mentioned just like if it tastes good, if you have a spouse that wants to, you know, that's kind of a resistant. Plant-based food is so amazing, and I feel like there's so many more opportunities to experiment with plant-based meals, and it's so exciting to do that. And what you can create is just really empowering and when you share that with somebody they naturally start to get on the bandwagon so there really isn't a lot of convincing i feel like when you start to make really good meals and now his meals actually he's kind of in charge because he is taking what he used to love the like cheesy meaty saucy foods and he's like i'm going to try to do this with cashew cheese instead of regular cheese and his meals are blowing mine out of the water but um so he's in charge <laughs> he's acquired himself a new, a new job now but uh but yeah and i think just like making them good investing in some good recipes and it, it really is easy to convince people when you just kind of learn how to cook the plant-based way and, and it, it tastes delicious excellent well, I um, wanted to also ask you, this is also a question that I was asked about no dairy, 
right? If, if you cut out dairy, actually, it, I really experienced a, a immediate improvement, how I, my skin fell, and I remember used to say, you know, I'm already over 50, I still get this, why? <laughs> but after I cutting all the dairy out, that just went away. So I noticed the, the immediate change, but I get asked, why do you get calcium? You know, as I, we are aging, I mean, I'm getting older, so osteoporosis, osteoporosis is one of those concerns. And so I was asked that question. Can you address from your perspective? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I mean, calcium is actually fairly easy to get from plants. And it's interesting because it really depends on the absorption rate. So the calcium absorption from dairy is about 30%. Um, soy milk and tofu, um, they're great sources of calcium. It's also about 30% absorption. Um, but then you have like broccoli and kale that are really great sources of calcium, and that absorption is about 60 to 65 percent. Um, there are things, there are substances in plants called oxalates, which you may have heard of. Um, there are some physicians who are anti-plants because of oxalates and phytates. They're, they're called anti-nutrients, and it is a real thing. Um, plants produce these crystals to basically defend themselves from like bugs and outdoor elements. So we, we eat them when we eat plants. Um, some are higher than others. All plants are going to have some sort of oxalates and phytates. Um, but like say spinach, for example, and um, Swiss chard, they're very high in oxalates. So the calcium absorb absorption in those, oxalates bind to calcium. So the absorption in that is very, very low. So even though spinach is high in calcium, you're not going to get a lot from it. Um, but if you eat foods like um, tahini is one product that is super high in calcium with a good absorption rate. Um, leafy grains, like I just mentioned, that aren't high in oxalate. There's like oxalate list online you can find like which are best. But in general, it's Swiss chard, Swiss chard, dandelion grains, and spinach are kind of like the highest oxalate. But kale, broccoli, um, chia seeds, awesome source. Okay, I love your idea of pouring some water. Great source of calcium. Um, but it's really easy to get. A, you know, 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. If you look online at any calcium sources, you can see how easily it adds up. Um, but it's not just calcium that's important in bone, bone health, too. It's important to remember to get some sunlight from vitamin D. You've got a lot of other nutrients that participate in um, bone growth and, and maintenance. But calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K is huge, and that's kind of being newly researched now, and that's super high in all kinds of leafy greens and plant-based um, uh, foods, um, magnesium, um, yeah. So uh, basically, a lot of the nutrients that that help with bones are found in plants. Um, and calcium, there's also the thought that the protein in calcium may inhibit some of the the uh, bone resorption. So yeah. So basically, I, I feel like it's not to worry about the calcium intake. You guys have anything to add to that? No, I mean it's you know to me that that's just so funny because. I got to get calcium from milk and then I ask people well when uh, cows that are given the milk well are they still drinking milk from their mother so where are they getting their calcium from from the darn grass right so it's, it's, it's idiotic right I mean you, 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 it, you're, the, the cow is like the middle person they're not drinking their mother's milk but they get calcium. Where do they get their calcium from? Right, the same place you can get yours from, from the plants. But so, I mean, yeah, it's it's, and yeah, it's there's 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 no reason why we need to consume the excretion of a bovine. <laughs> For what reason? Would you do that? I mean, if you see a lactating woman, I mean, you wouldn't think that you want some milk. <laughs> but from another species, it's okay. What makes it? It's idiotic, man. Only the people that sell it. Would say that it doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. What about other, <laughs> what are other micronutrients? Like some people believe you gotta eat steak. You gotta eat steak for is it um, vitamin A or uh, zinc or iron or you know those um, you know micronutrients. I guess um, some people believe in that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's similar, iron is similar to calcium in that the absorption um, can vary, and the iron absorption in plants is, can be low. It's, it's a non human iron, so animal iron is more readily absorbed. It's also been linked to cancer, um, so it's not necessarily the healthier form of iron. Um, 
Athletes who are plant-based may have higher iron needs and plant-based in general. The, uh, I will say the RDA for iron is 18 milligrams for women and eight milligrams for men. Um, and for plant-based eaters and athletes, it may be higher because endurance athletes in running and any kind of um, red blood cell like hemolysis, you're losing some iron. Women during menstruation, you're losing iron. Um, you can get plenty of iron from plants. Again, the oxalates and phytates in some of the plants can, uh, can um, decrease absorption, but there's still plenty of ways through beans and um, soy products and nuts and seeds. Um, the way that you can increase iron absorption is by eating vitamin C foods. So for example, if you're having tacos with black beans and you have a red salsa that's made with tomato, tomatoes are really high in vitamin C, that can increase your iron absorption by, by like fivefold. Um, or like oatmeal with blueberries. Blueberries are high in vitamin C, oatmeal is high in iron. So combining high vitamin C foods with iron based, uh, plant based high iron foods um, can help a lot. So yeah, I think it's important just to like note that athletes, plant based athletes especially might need a little bit more than the average RDA just because, especially female athletes because of menstruation, they lose iron stores throughout the month. And I'll just make a quick note that that's something that I was also looking at um, when uh, the longest I run disclaimer is, is a marathon, which Jackie coached me for. Uh, but when I was also looking into different sources and making sure that my uh, vitamins and micronutrients are on point, I was also looking into the iron. And another thing that I learned on top of vitamin C is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but caffeine also uh, prevents the, the iron absorption. So if you are trying to get more iron, whatever sources that you are eating of iron, try to eat them at least an hour after you've had co caffeine. So if you have a cup of coffee and then you eat like beans and tomatoes, there's not gonna be a whole lot of iron absorption. So you need to give it time between the caffeine and then the, the whatever sources of iron you're eating. Exactly. It's a good yep. thing we don't have caffeine. <laughs> right. Can, I didn't say you can't have it. You have to wait. Um, now that you mentioned, now that you mentioned about soy, can you address this myth about uh, we shouldn't eat soy or men shouldn't eat soy products, otherwise you get estrogen, too much estrogen, or shouldn't give that to kids because they get estrogen. There are a lot of myths and information out there. Can you? Uh, Men, that men will not grow man boobs from soy. <laughs> That's definitely not going to happen. Um, they, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so men will not grow man boobs <laughs> from soy. And um, so for, there are a lot of, there was a time when there, there was research that wasn't really well done and um, on animals that showed that there might be a correlation to soy and breast cancer. Um, the media grabs on to any little thing like that and loves to just kind of blow it up and that's just all they run with. And it might be like one conclusion that somebody came with from that article and that's just what everybody heard and, and it's stuck. Um, there's been a lot of new research now that in breast cancer patients, if they have a couple of servings of soy a day, like organic, least processed soy, tofu, tempeh, um, that their recurrence of cancer is 35% less. So it's actually recommended in breast cancer survivors now. Um, the, 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 there are isoflavones in soy, and that's what basically, it's like, a, it's like an estrogen, um, it's similar to the estrogen molecule in, in, in um, humans. So basically what I've seen in the research is that whatever your estrogen levels are, it can either act as an estrogen or not. So that's why in menopausal women who have hot flashes, it's recommended that they eat soy because they're lacking estrogen. So in that case, soy can help mimic estrogen in their body. If you have excess estrogen, it's not gonna produce. Your body basically regulates with the, with the soy. That's what I've seen in the research. Um, there have been some studies on heart health and in kids that have, um, no, it's also dependent on the population. Like in, in Asia where it's most popular, kids have, um, who eat soy at a very young age, their incidence of high cholesterol and heart disease later in life is much less than kids here in this country. Um, so it depends on ethnicity, a lot of it. There, there really are not like a lot of conclusion, conclusions around that, but we know like in Asian countries, they have 
um, better bone density, less heart disease, and a lot of it is sought because of the soy. But we don't know if that like translates over to here. But we do know that all of the bad hype that happened earlier is not necessarily true. Um, bone health, there are some studies that it could help with bone health, and there are studies that say that it may not do anything. But there isn't really any negative evidence that I've seen that says don't have this going to cause bone loss. It's either it doesn't do anything or it might help. Um, so yes, tofu, tempeh, the least processed soy, I do recommend organic. Um, so tofu, tempeh, miso, edamame, soybeans um, are perfectly fine to do them daily. And, and I, I, would, yeah, I would add to that that anybody that has any type of cancer, I mean, should immediately don't ever consume any dairy because you're consuming exogenous estrogen, just flat up estrogen. Breast cancer, the research that I've read on breast cancer is that 80% of the growth comes from estrogen, right? Estrogen feeds breast cancer, right? And consuming, so consuming any kind of dairy, be it, be it from milk or from cheese or from sour cream or from ice cream, you're, you're, you are taking that exogenous estrogen from that animal and putting that, you're feeding the cancer versus soy that actually block, it, it, it combines, to, it, it hits those receptors and blocks estrogen that a woman produces. So it's actually protective. Soy is actually protective in two ways. The first way is that it actually binds to that uh, receptor that prevents her own estrogen from feeding the cancer cell. And secondly, uh, even women that are uh, postmenopausal, uh, the adipose tissue, the fat tissue, actually makes its own estrogen. And soy blocks that. So soy is very protective for somebody that has, uh, you know, for women that have breast cancer. I mean, I mean, am I? I mean, you know, because you live by myself, but I got a registered dietitian next to me. It's also been shown, actually, um, so it's been studied in men to, for to cover both genders and prostate cancer. And it's exactly. Thank you. For prostate cancer as well. Thank you. Jackie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, um, I'll just say any time some question like this um, kind of arises for me, um, about soy or anything else, my go-to um, resource is nutritionfacts.org. Um, Dr. Michael Greger kind of runs it and um, has compiled, all, he's kind of done all of the legwork for you in terms of like diving into PubMed and like going down those rabbit holes. He has all of this kind of compiled for you and he usually has a short like video on it or something and he also has a post about it. But what I love about his nutritionfacts.org is that all of the peer-reviewed references are listed at the bottom, so you can literally go to those articles yourself and read the science. Like, if you read a conclusion about some study and you're like, how in the heck did you study that or get to that conclusion? Go read it for yourself because I'm telling you, a lot of times, um, I do not agree with the conclusions that some people make off of experiments that were actually done. So sometimes you actually need to go do that. I mean, I'm a scientist, so I love doing that stuff, but um, I really recommend nutritionfacts.org for that reason, because he does list peer-reviewed articles, and a lot of these articles now are actually available to the public, so you can actually download them yourself. They're, these studies are a lot of times funded by taxpayer money, at least you hope they are, otherwise they might be funded by dairy industry and that type of thing, so that is also something to look at like when you're reading articles, um, and I guess that's a whole other conversation of how do you read an article um, critically and like make some conclusions from it, which I think is actually really important. Maybe we have another uh, panel about that. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, I really hours. recommend nutritionfacts.org because um, for especially those of you who are kind of like new to making the um, transition to becoming more plant-based, um, a lot of questions like this are gonna come up for you. And um, a lot of it's gonna be really specific and nuanced and stuff like that. And like the phytoestrogens in soy, and it's just like totally beyond like the scope of what most of us do on a daily basis to like really know the nitty gritty and like details of that science. And so um, I just really, for stuff like that, um, I really like that for um, using that as a resource for that. Yeah, I second nutrition facts with Org too, and uh, he, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a non-profit, he does not take any funding from any of the big whatever industries there are that could support any kind of potential bias, and uh, uh, it's literally, I don't remember which year he started, but there's like 
years and years worth of articles and videos, and you can just type in the search bar whatever that you're interested in, protein, I don't know, the, the kidney disease or what a soybeans, you just type it in, there's like a line of different articles and videos that are easy to digest, and then if you want to learn more, you can go in and go look at each specific study and look at it. And then Jackie mentioned also looking at who's sponsoring the study, that we read about is, is very, very important. Because there is a, somebody sponsored it, then there is a study, and then there's a newspaper that picked up the two words from the study and put them to whatever the new trend mm-hmm. thing is. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it is sad, but it is the reality of the world we live in. Like, you really do have to go look at the data yourself right. sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can't just read the, the journal post or whatever, right. um, yeah. you know, so. Right, because the, the food companies will make studies that to get the results that they want and just report like part of it. Like the, like the, egg, the egg board had to do that with, around cholesterol, right? So, so we, we, we know that when you eat eggs, it increases your cholesterol and you increase your cholesterol, you increase your risk of heart disease. Like we know that. Okay, so now if you work for the egg board, so how do you, how do you, how do you combat that? Well, we also know that if, you, if you've got a high cholesterol, let's say your cholesterol is 250, and you go from eating like one egg a day to eating two eggs a day, your cholesterol stays at 250. So the, so the conclusion that they write is eating eggs doesn't increase, your, it, it, it doesn't increase your cholesterol. That's bullshit. <laughs> but they do, but then they won't tell you the behind the scenes stuff. They'll just say you double the amount of eggs and there's no increase in cholesterol. They're tricking you, right? They're tricking you. But they're paid to do that. The egg board pays them to come up with studies so that they can say increasing eggs, increasing your consumption of eggs does not increase cholesterol. So yeah, you gotta you gotta see who's funding the study and, and the backup line. Jackie, if that's okay with you, maybe we can take a few questions from the crowd. Sure. Um, um, and then if we can go back to our questions. I just want to make sure if there are any burning ones in the in the crowd we can get them. Looks like this is one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a burning desire in here. Uh, so, um, I'd like to ask. He can about, just speak up so everybody yeah. can hear the question. Yeah, I'd like mm-hmm. to ask about vitamin B12. If mm-hmm. you can get it on a plant by plant based diet, or if you do have to supplement. I, I personally recommend supplementation. Um, there, when you take meat and dairy out of the diet, you do miss B12, and our soil is not sufficient enough to get enough B12. There are fortified foods, so you can get um, a couple of teaspoons of nutritional yeast a day, Red Star specifically, nutritional yeast. They don't all have fortified mm-hmm. uh, B12 in them, but a couple of teaspoons of that a day can give you the amount of B12 that you need. So if you did that daily, and maybe you had, um, personally, like if I'm looking for an, a, a plant-based milk in the grocery store, a lot of them are the same. Soy milk's the only one that naturally has equivalent protein to dairy. Um, most of them don't have a lot of protein, but they do look for B12 and D and calcium, like the extra vitamins fortified in those just to get a boosted B12. Um, so you can get it through like, fortified foods, fortified orange juice, but if you're not having them daily, I do think it's good reassurance to do either B12 in like a B complex that has B12 or sublingual B12 by itself, just as reassurance, because um, symptoms of deficiency don't show up until a year later. Like you, won't, you don't know immediately when you're deficient. So I think it's good prevention to take a B12 daily. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's the only supplement I take, by the way. Right, we have questions. I have a question. She took the, one of the questions, <laughs> but I have a question about the consumption of soy. Um, how often can you have that? You know, within a week. You know, how, is it? Can you do it every day, or should you just do two days? Or no, they're so saying soy, every day is fine. Soy, soy, soy is not a problem. Okay, it's not a problem. It's ma- and, and soy is very beneficial. Yeah, I mean, it's really just the it's just the opposite of what. You think yeah, it's very I, I, Yeah, I did uh, read that they did research and they found out that it was curing or assisting in curing yeah. cancer. And and, and, yeah, and, so. and and but to your point though, I mean I would say even maybe as recently as five, ten years ago, yeah. I mean many doctors were saying to avoid soy. I mean I know there are many doctors were saying many doctors were saying avoid it, but they were wrong. And it's because the chemical structure of the of that phytoestrogen, the isoflavone looks chemically a whole lot like estrogen. So the, the molecular structure is similar, 
But that turns out to be a good thing. Because if, you, if, if somebody has cancer, it actually blocks that receptor from, from real estrogen from making that cancer cell to grow. So it's actually protective. Soy is a good thing. Soy is a good thing. I do think organic. And I, I know you so, have. Definitely organic because more soy and corn, 80% of, of the corn and soy made in this country goes to feeding animals. So most of the soy and corn made in this country is going to be GMO. So if there's one thing to do organic, I would try to do those organic more than anything. So yes. So you have a question. What do you think of dairy-free yogurt? I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, because my, you know, dairy is like just like anything from a cow is just so horrific from your body standpoint and from the cow standpoint. It's one of the cruelest foods ever. But a dairy-free yogurt, I. I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm, I mean, they're usually soy-based, um, stone, coconut-based, coconut-based, cashew. Oh, I didn't, I didn't cashew. even know that. Cashew. I, I put them in here. Do you eat yogurt? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't put it, but I'm. I don't I'm eat fine. yogurt regularly. I have made my own yogurt and done all of that stuff before. Uh, I don't anymore. It's kind of a pain. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with eating plant-based yogurt for sure. But. Um, Aside from like you have to watch some of the ones just like you do with like dairy yogurt with like the added sugar and like all the added like sugary syrup stuff in there that they can put in sometimes if you buy it in the store, but um, the the main reason I see that the rationale people use for um, eating yogurt is to get the probiotics right you want the gut microbiome it's this like really interesting um, and uh, really rapidly accelerating field of science right now. Um, you guys probably have heard of the gut microbiome and like know some things about it now. Um, but um, you're really eating yogurt, from my perspective, the primary health benefits are to get those probiotics, which are the actual bacteria that will then populate your gut. But um, you can also create your gut microbiome and like the, the culture of your gut microbiome, if you wanna call it that. Um, from just eating whole foods too, like whole foods and plant-based. So you don't need to add, at least from my view and the data that I've looked at, adding like, if you're already eating whole foods, plant-based diet and um, doing like beans and kale and leafy greens and like grains and all of this stuff, those bacteria in your gut are looking pretty good right now. And yeah, adding like an extra probiotic and plus then there's this whole question of like, well, what bacteria are we actually talking about? Because there's like billions of kinds and you're not just wanting to like dump some random type of bacteria in your gut like without, and there's not a lot of science on what type of bacteria we should be eating anyway. So my view on it is like, I'm just eating whole foods and my gut microbiome are like proliferating and like um, thriving on that rather than like adding the extra, but that's kind of my view. and. There's some mixed research on the vet health benefits of taking probiotics, and really it's, uh, what I think, um, my opinion is that it's just because we don't know enough about the species of bacteria that we should actually be eating. Um, and what, what we do know is that we should be eating whole foods that are plants. So that's kind of my view on it. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, I would say, understand the difference between a prebiotic and a probiotic, right? A probiotic is actually the live culture. Right, and, and, and yogurts have that, kimchi has that, you know, fermented foods have, have, have that actual live culture. But what I think is more and more important to Jackie's point is when you eat beans and grains and oatmeal and potatoes, then, uh, you know, soluble fibers, insoluble fiber, you're, 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 you're feeding your gut what it needs so that the right bacteria grows. You're feeding, because the bacteria in your gut is feeding off of whatever you ate. And most Americans aren't eating a lot of plant-based foods. So their gut, so, so the, 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 uh, the bacteria that's growing in their gut is a different type of bacteria that's growing in the gut of somebody that's eating a lot of whole plant-based foods. And so, and so when you feed yourself um, you know, the, the, the beans and the rice and the grains and those types of uh, uh, soluble and insoluble fibers, then you make the right type of bacteria such that you get short chain fatty, the right short chain fatty acids, which just does a myriad of wonderful things, controls your cholesterol, controls your blood pressure. Getting those short chain fatty acids is just 
wonderful, wonderful for your body. And that happens when you have the right prebiotics, greens, beans, grains, and then it takes care of itself. Yeah, I have a quick question on, on the vegetables. Uh, do you compromise on the nutrition of the vegetables if you're cooking them or steaming them? Does that make a difference? It depends on the vegetables. Some are better raw and some are better, you could lightly cook them. I would say no vegetables are good when you kill them, like if you overcook them and kill right. them. But, um, boiling is usually the best, like a quick like blanch or boil is the best way to, to preserve the nutrition in the vegetable um, or just lightly steaming. Those are usually best. But that said, I saute my vegetables just so, I, you know, I like my broccoli just like a little crunchy but not super I can't personally eat it raw so I think it depends on your individual right. digestive system too but like something like carrots the nutrients are more available when you cook them versus eating them raw so it really depends on the vegetables so I think you should just find like what you love and the way you like to cook don't kill them maybe cook them lightly and um, that'll at least preserve most of the nutrition and for some of them it just it makes them more bioavailable like peppers green peppers you know green peppers, peppers also yeah cooking them lightly is perfectly fine right. it'll preserve nutrition yeah we have a lot of questions. Okay, I think it really has a question. Actually, I just wanted to bring it up because I think a lot of people are interested because when I stop eating animal meat, what I notice, not just only my skin or dairy product, my recovery, I felt, this is just my, because you know we tend to pay attention to how we feel, triathletes, you know, we train and we just know how we should feel in terms of exertions and all that. And what I noticed, is recovery is better. And I talked to other people who stopped eating animal meat and cut it, cutting out dairy, said the same thing. So I just want you guys to address how that mechanism works and why recovery is better eating plant-based. Because uh, for us, we do, you know, racking up a volume. I mean, Jackie, I won't do that distance, but <laughs> racking up a volume and we need to recover to do the the training for next day, and then the next day is very, very critical. So I just want you to address some of those things. Maybe Jackie, you can start since you know. All right. So I think it might be helpful to just um, kind of take a, a very gross uh, simplification of what we are actually doing when we train. Yes. Okay, so what we're doing is we're basically um, giving our bodies a stimulus and then our bodies are going to recover from that stimulus strong, to a point where we are stronger than we were before. And then we're going to train again and give it another stimulus and slam it down. And it's going to recover again. And so you, what you have is you start here, you train, you go back down immediately. But then you come back up a little higher than you were, right? You train again, you go down. You come back up a little higher than you were, you go down, higher. So you're like literally doing this when you're training. I mean, this is a broad simplification. But that's literally what we're doing to build fitness when we train for an event, like a 100 mile ultra marathon, I'd say. Um, and so, <laughs> and so that's, and that's, that's, that's your goal, right? You wanna right, get from right, here right. to here, and the way that you're gonna do that is to just repeatedly give your body these training stimuli, stimuli over a period of time to get you up to here. If I can do that faster, if I can get in more training stimuli, and recover faster, I'm going like this versus this, right? So I'm ending up here, down here. So that's just, I think it's helpful to just look at why we want to, why this is so critical from an athletic perspective to speed up recovery to the, um, the maximum that we can. Because a lot of people think it's all about load, load, and I just need to like, you know, do 10 intervals instead of eight intervals and like that. But really, from my view, it's like, no, we just want to get in more like sessions because that's how you're getting here better. So like recovery is absolutely critical. It's not just plant-based plant -based and eating. It's everything in your life that's affecting your recovery. But that aside, plant-based helps a lot. And I saw it um, when I went, when I became plant-based, I was an athlete. I was running ultra marathons and training for them. Um, I guess I want to say like, the first thing I noticed in ter when I went plant-based that was really like objective for me was that um, I think this was like probably about three weeks into um, into being plant-based. 
I noticed that like, and I was working in the lab, I was a grad student, so I was like training, I was running like, I don't know, 60 miles a week, and then I was working in the lab all day, and then I was doing classes at night, and um, all the things, and what I always had was around like two to three o'clock, like after lunch, I would just get this like, oh, like I need to take a nap. Like I was just so tired, and it was like a normal thing, right? This is like your mid-afternoon lull, like everyone talks about it. This is just like part of being human, right? It's not, at least not for me. Like I went, I, after I became plant-based, I stopped getting that. And that was like amazing because that was just like, it wasn't even just about my athletic pursuits, but it was about my entire life, right? Like I was being more productive in my science. I was like sleeping better. I was recovering better. Like I would do a workout and then um, the same workout I would do that would take me like four days to recover from, like two and a half days later, I'm like, I'm like ready to go again. Um, and so those were like the objective things I really noticed. And I think it all kind of ties into that whole um, art, like it's all under this umbrella of recovery. Um, my body was just able to recover. I was getting just more out of everything. And those are the things I personally noticed. I know not everyone's experience will be the same, but that's just mine. So. I, I, that is one of the best descriptions that I've ever heard on, on, on recovery. That's, that, that is excellent. And what's happening when you have that, you know, you break down, but then you build back stronger, you break down, you're actually causing oxidation. You're causing, your training is causing oxidative stress. And when you eat animal-based products, it adds to that oxidative stress versus antioxidants or in plant-based foods. So inflammation, chronic inflammation, acute inflammation. Acute inflammation, if you fall down and you, know, you get a swollen knot on your head or something like that, that's acute inflammation, right? I mean, you, they'll, they'll, you, you've, got, you've got your uh, immune system that's drawing fluids to that to heal that acute injury that you just had. That is a good thing. But chronic inflammation, Right, and there's and there's medical tests you can do that CRP, you know, C-reactive protein, high sensitive C-reactive protein is a test that you can do to measure your level of chronic inflammation. And when people go plant-based, typically what you see is their C, their their, uh, their C-reactive protein goes down. The chronic inflammation goes down, right? And so you're consuming foods that that are antioxidants. So the breakdown that she talked about, but then you build back up better. That's, that process causes oxidative stress, and it's the antioxidants, okay, that's in berries and, 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 and greens and beans. That is what causes you to be able to recover faster. It's the, anti, it's the natural anti-inflammatories, the natural antioxidants that's in plant-based foods that lowers your level of chronic inflammation and reduces oxidative stress. Do you have anything to add? Well, uh, those are both excellent. And, um, yeah, I, I, just to add one little thing. Uh, when you substitute, like you mentioned, Azumi, mm -hmm. uh, plants for meat products, um, so for example, if you do a couple beans in place of red meat, you're not only adding the antioxidants that Vince is talking about, but you're also getting a plant-based protein instead of a meat protein, which, is, which has been shown to cause inflammation. So the type of protein that you're getting makes a difference, as well as the saturated fat, which is also inflammatory, um, you're not getting in the beans, um, in addition to fiber, which Jackie mentioned, that helps to heal the gut. So there are just so many compounds in plants that actually are proactive in, in, um, in the anti-inflammatory process, and there's so many things in dairy and animal-based products that are inflammatory. So there's just a lot of components that go into it. Okay, well thank you. Back to questions here? Yeah. Should we try to set like a shorter answer? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah okay. We want to respect We're everybody's time, but let's, I know let's we have this, 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 this guy had his hand up a long time, yeah, I'm sorry. Let's, let's, let's get this guy. Fish. Good, bad, and different. Fish? Yeah. Time is on. One word answer. Good, There's, bad, or indifferent. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, so, so I would say that, that there, there, there's nothing in any animal-based food that you need that you can't get from plants. Um, you know, levels of, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it still has saturated fat, still has cholesterol. Um, 
I like the Adventist study. Again, my whole thing is on, um, you know, preventing diabetes and heart disease and things like that. And the Seventh, seventh Day Adventist, gosh, you told me to slow down my answers. Gosh, I can't. I can't no, slow down. I, can't, I mean, to like make them short. Answer, but... So the Adventist study studied um, the results of diabetes in their in their population. They looked at people that ate kind of the standard American diet, then they looked at those that, uh, you know, all the way down to the 100% vegans, okay? And so then the lacto-ovo and then the pescatarian. So the pescatarians were better than the standard American diet, but was not as good as the vegan. So it's a step better. And, and, and uh, you know, to, the, to, to I think Azumi's point is, you know, you don't, necess- you don't have to be all or nothing. Every state, and I think the healthiest way to eat is unprocessed plant-based foods. I think that's utopia. But every step you take in that direction is a good thing. Do you have to be 100%? No, you don't have to be 100%. I mean, if you go from the standard American diet to getting rid of junk and sugars and processed foods and Doritos and, I mean, that stuff that tastes great but is horrible for you, what's a Cheeto? Can somebody tell you what's a Cheeto? What is that? What is that orange stuff? Right? It, it can't be a healthy thing. I mean, you clean up all of that and all you have left with is what I'd recommend, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and you've got fish to that. You've made a huge improvement. So it all depends on in comparison to what. So you ask me, is fish healthy food compared to what? Compared to what? So yes, I'm, I don't know if that was too um, I'm, I'm born and raised in Japan. I'm Japanese. It's just hard to give up on if I have an opportunity to get any sushi or sashimi or, yeah. right, Nikki? I don't, I will say, yes, I'm going to enjoy It's good for my soul. But day, day to day, you know, we need to do that. Something like, um, uh, something good for the soul, you need to do that time to time. I don't avoid it. But day to day, I don't cook, I don't eat. Um, and so it's really making an improvement. Yeah. Is fish good for you, depending on what you compare with? Definitely. Yeah. I think it's a good point to say compare it to what because the thing compare is with that with any study with any change that you make in it what what was before and now what you're doing right okay so maybe the next question if you have a preference yeah let's do you because you were into this okay. for a while I if actually, you have a preference uh, tell the name that yeah. you want the question to be asked no, I to I don't, he doesn't know. I don't care who answered it. Okay. I have two questions, but you can answer it yes or no. <laughs> Would you use canned beans, like the canned lentils or anything like that? Yes or yeah. no? Ab- absolutely, but I, but I check, but I, but I do want to make sure that I get no salt added. Okay. And if it does have salt, because sometimes the price is great, but sometimes you can't find a little salt, then I put it in the calendar and rinse it off. Okay. But other than that, canned is... I, I eat canned beans a lot. And what about the canned waters, these carbonated waters? Good or bad? Yes or no? I, think I would say the thing, this isn't a plant-based thing, but the thing to watch out for with any of these canned products is the BPA, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, right. BPA is... BPA. Okay. It's like, um, I mean, you can look this up online, but basically BPA is not the can itself, but it's like this plastic film they use inside the can. Okay. And some of that plastic film has BPA in it. And in summary, um, what I want to keep this answer short, BPA is not good for you. It's actually babies <laughs> in the US. Our government has actually tried to protect infants from it because it is that bad for a human body to consume. So all baby bottles, everything, they're not illegally allowed to make them with BPA. No baby food jars and cans can have BPA. But really, it's not good for human bodies. Like, it's not just infant babies. So really, we should all be trying to avoid BPA as much as possible. Um, so just watch the BPA and the cans and the soda stuff and that type of thing, I would say. Okay, Jess? Um, so when we first switched a couple months ago to the plant-based diet, we did purple carrot to try to like get some new um, recipe ideas so I didn't have to like think about it and it wasn't disgusting when we first started because <laughs> I don't cook. Um, but almost every recipe, either through them or like through a recipe book, has you add olive oil in some form or fashion. Like, is that okay or is there like... Should we not be doing that? Is there a way to cook without oil? But I just I don't cook, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. Olive, oil. Yeah. Olive oil. Yeah. I mean, you could use um, vegetable broth in place yeah, of any right. oils. Very you can always water. replace oil in most things you cook with like something else, like veggie broth, water, yeah. that type of thing. Actually, the book How Not to Die, um, the, from nutrition, the guy that does nutritionfacts.org, um, they use all what's called green light food. So basically, like 
they don't use any like oils like that so that's like a good that actually gave me a lot of like ideas of like how did I cook without additive oil um, but it's not ideal but you know just if you keep it to a minimum it's like you know it's fine. Go ahead. So this question is for Nicole and it's actually related to that question. Um, if olive oils, coconut oils, if these plant-based oils are still coming from whole plants What's so bad about it, other than the word process? Like, what's, right. what's because you basically stripped it off of the actual exactly food, right? right? Like, yeah. you're basically just you, stripping the fat and the oil off of the nutritive thing that was whole at one point and grew out of the ground. So the closer you can get to that thing that grew out of the ground, that's right. The best, that's right. the better. That's right. So like. You know, and it uh, compared to what? That's something that Michael Greger says a lot on nutritionfacts.org. Like, is olive oil bad for you compared to what? Bacon grease? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> a carrot? Uh, yeah, it is. Eat the carrot, you know? Like, um, it's, it's really, there is no good food for you, bad food for you. Like, it's, it's not black and white like that a lot. Like, it's not like, oh, olive oil's good. Let me, like, drink half a cup of it. Like, you know, it's just, um, the closer you can get to the whole, Thing that grew out of the ground at, at as its like original element, the better off it. Yeah. But and a lot of yeah. the oil stigmas come from Dr. Esselin in California. He the the no oils, which a lot of people are on that on that bandwagon, and it's true exactly what Jackie said. Is you're not getting all the other components in the plant, but also the oil thing came from reversal of heart disease. So right. he had patients that had like. Um, very severe heart disease, quadruple bypass, he wanted to reverse their heart disease. So they were absolutely not to have any oil at all. They had to have the whole avocado, not avocado oil, or only oil. So their diet was very strict, and that's kind of where that all came from. That's right. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so I recently listened to a podcast um, by Dr. Stacy Sims. She likes to do a lot of research mm -hmm. on female athletes, and she uh, the question was, what do you think of female vegans? And her response was that um, you don't get enough leucine. So what is the, I mean, I know we get enough protein when we eat plant-based, but what about the specific amino acid? According to Dr. Stacy Sims, it's really hard to get enough leucine in your diet, um, even if you eat a lot of, so do you have any comment on that? Variety, number one, because no, uh, there are a couple of plant, a handful of plants that do have all nine essential amino acids that we need, like soy, um, quinoa, but not all of them do. So some of them might be very low in leucine, and some of them might be low in other essential amino acids. Um, this book, actually, that I bought, if you, if anyone's interested in like a bible of sports nutrition, is fantastic, and they have a list of like the specific amino acids that like which food, which. Um, Plant-based foods are high and low in certain amino acids. I cannot tell you right off the top of my head which is high in leucine, <laughs> but um, it's a great reference. Okay, so that's not anything that you worry about. I guess that's the, you know, you don't think, am I getting enough leucine? Yeah. <laughs> um, Stacy Sims is a polarizing figure. Um, I think uh, she she has a, a lot of um, like I think she she has a lot of good things, but there are also things that she says that I found not to be supported by actual data. Um, I don't know the leucine thing um, specifically, but I would, and I would like to actually look at the data on that, so um, I'll look at that like afterwards and see, um, like after the panel, because that, that's interesting. But um, I, uh, I personally haven't, have never had a problem with recovering or with it, you know, my recovery, like I spoke to earlier, is like accelerated. So that's kind of my experience that I've had. And like, I've been doing this for 10 years and running a heck of a lot and doing pretty well at some races. So like, maybe, like, could I potentially be having some detriment in my performance because I'm not getting in the leucine? Like, maybe, I don't know. But like, that hasn't been my experience at all. Like, I've gotten a lot faster. I've recovered a lot better since going plant-based. I've eaten a variety of foods. Um, and so, I don't know, that just, that hasn't been my experience. But that is an interesting point. And um, maybe, and I don't know all the data on leucine, like, do, is there a critical amount that you might need for like optimal recovery? I don't know how much research has been done on that and then how much has been done on actual humans in that. Um, but like, uh, but maybe that's that's an area, but that just I think for like from 
that's kind of like the really like nitty gritty of this stuff. But like from an overarching like health perspective, performance perspective, like can you do this healthily? Can you have success as a plant-based athlete? Like I hope at least I can, and, and some of like other amazing athletes out there that are also plant-based, um, we're just like examples, we can be examples that like, yes, you can do this and be successful and have a lot of success and it's not going to be detrimental to your performance. And I hope that we can at least um, provide that example, so. And just to uh, see, yeah. leucine is not mentioned here as like something to look out for. They just happen to list like yeah. all the amino acids, but I've not seen anything like that either in anything that I've read. I uh, read the book, mm -hmm. uh, Roar, too, mm -hmm. and I was wondering the same thing. When you feel like, oh, this expert said, mm -hmm. it creates a lot of confusion mm -hmm. and doubt mm -hmm. of what I was doing, and I thought, oh, I need to maybe really pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that yeah. you mentioned about this question that you had and you addressed it. Um, but anything afterwards that might be useful, I'd be happy to post it on my Facebook page or event page that you can have access to, like a website or some of the study maybe. Uh, they can May I make a suggestion yeah. about that? So maybe, I'm, I'm taking notes for like the bigger the kind of resources that we mentioned. Yeah. And then maybe if uh, each of this panel speakers want to contribute, like if you want to share the name of the book, whatever other resources yes. that you have, we can put a quick newsletter and send you a blast after this so you don't have to theoretically write down the yeah. notes right now, or we try to remember right. the name of the book, so we'll send it to you through email, if that's okay, is that okay with everybody here? Yes. Yeah, that works? Okay. okay, we'll just do that. Excellent. Do you put her smoothie in that too? Yeah. Yes, you got it, you got it. Do you want green kind or red kind? <laughs> All right, so this probably could be like an hour-long discussion by itself, but what do you guys think about the impossible Whopper? The, the beyond the, yeah. Compared yeah. to what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. An actual Whopper? Hell yes. Yeah. Like, Thank you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Compared yeah. to the carrot or the like, <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. It was grown in a lab, you know? Like, yeah. it, there's, so. there's, three, there's three main reasons to be vegan. Number one, you're not killing animals by being vegan. Number two, you're helping the environment. The largest contributor to greenhouse gases in the world is animal agriculture. Uh, uh, Australia is on fire right now, right? The Amazon is on fire right now. Global warming is a real thing and animal agriculture is a huge contributor to that. The third reason to be plant-based is because of health. So the Impossible Burger does a great job on animals aren't being killed, number one. It does a great job on, it's not contributing to, uh, to, to greenhouse gases, number two. On the health side, not so much. It's, it's, loaded, it's loaded with saturated fat, it's loaded with fat, and saturated fat, which is one of the fats that you're really trying to avoid. Um, so I, I may have, I had it once, I mean, I may have it up, have one of those things maybe once or twice a year, maybe. I mean, it's not on my never list, but it, it is not a regular thing. I'm really glad they came out with it, and I hope that it's successful. Uh, and, and I think it's really targeted towards people who uh, are meat eaters. And so if a meat eater is eating an Impossible Burger or a Beyond Burger instead of a regular burger, and animals aren't being killed, and it, they're not contributing to greenhouse gases as much, that is a win. That is a win. Yes. And from, from a health standpoint, if you compare the, the health standpoint of a Beyond Burger and a regular burger, I would say that uh, the, you know, those Beyond Burger and Pasta Burger is probably a little bit better, but not, you know, you're not eating it because of the health standpoint. Also, you have to be careful because I mean, if you cook at home, that's one thing, but if you go and get Beyond Burger or whatever at a restaurant, it's cooked on the same. That's right, the that's right. That's right. That's right. It's really not made for the vegans. It's it's really made for ninety eight percent of the U.S. population that are non vegans, and if they can give them something, then again, those first two categories is really helpful. Okay, let's get does, a few does, more that, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Thanks. a few more questions. <laughs> so I'm just uh, concerned about bone health, and so obviously you want to rush into the calcium. Well, I've heard that if you eat too much calcium, it lowers your copper levels, which has to do with coordination. Is there a resource where you can find, like, too much of this causes this, or? 
nutritionbox.org has some great calcium resources <laughs> if you're interested. The, the rest of calcium, um, uh, supple and really calcium, calcium isn't specific, uh, like a specific nutrient, um, like a deficiency to plant-based uh, individuals um, versus meat-eating in individuals. That's kind of like a, a myth when you actually look at the data of this. Um, but there are some risks um, associated with eating, eating calcium supplements. I'm not sure if that's what you're getting at, but there are some risks to, act, to heart health, actually, by taking calcium supplements. So um, that's something to definitely watch out for if you're thinking about taking those type of supplements. Um, but I would, I, would, I would check that out um, and uh, see, see what the resources are there and recommendations. Um, I personally don't, I don't take calcium. Um, I eat a lot of like dark leafy greens are great sources of calcium. Like anytime you're like, oh, like a calcium, whatever, just dark leafy greens like pretty much have everything, every micronutrient in them. That's an overstatement, but like they have a lot of good stuff in them. Um, and so they're always a really, a really good thing to make sure you're getting. Um, it, how many of you guys use the Daily Dozen app? Anyone oh, use it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is a great app. It's free. It's there's like 12 things that you check off, and like they're all evidence based, and you find all the re rationale for why you're eating the thing. Flaxseed is something I eat every single day now because it is amazing for you. Everyone should be getting flaxseed in their body every day. Um, <laughs> and uh, but yeah, back to the calcium thing. The, the two I do take two supplements as um, not from like a plant based perspective, but as an athlete. One is vitamin D, and that's just because of my job. I work in um, a lab, and I don't get out in the sun a ton. I do a lot of my runs in the morning when it's dark, um, sometimes in the evening when it's dark, especially in the winter. Um, and so I don't get like vitamin D, like your, the dosage of vitamin D to get my vitamin D levels up. So I take vitamin D um, every day. Um, which I find help my levels with vitamin D. And then um, I also do take Floridix, which is like an iron supplement. Um, and I've been taking that since, uh, or I've been taking an iron supplement since before I was plant-based, um, just as, as an athlete. Um, just because I, I do get blood work and I find I'm like slightly low in the iron if I don't kind of supplement with that. It's an um, important point too, make sure yeah. like with iron, um, to get blood work done, or even vitamin D before you. I would definitely yeah vitamins, do blood work because like done. you want to see what's inside before you start adding stuff, right? Like yeah. you don't just want to start. I mean, a lot of people actually could benefit from vitamin D just because a lot of us yeah. work inside all day. But um, it's always good to if you go to your if you have health insurance, which I know is not a privilege for everyone, but usually health insurance from at least from, I don't know if it's all changed now, but they used to as of uh, last year had to. Um, uh, cover a one annual primary care visit a year and your doctor can order blood work and it's all covered by your insurance at least one time a year so you can take advantage of that and see what's inside your body. And which um, did you, which did you take? Oh, uh, Two or three? I take uh, the three, the, the D vegan one. You do have to, yeah that's a good point. A lot of, if you see like a really cheap vitamin D it probably is made from sheep wool. Just oh. kind of but um, yeah, you want to look for the, the uh, plant-derived vitamin D, which I think is the three, right? The D3, yeah. So we have a group called endurance athletes. So yeah. we, we talked about a lot of great stuff about, and you touched on uh, recovery and all that. So can you guys address uh, nitrates? Because that's a, you know, we're talking performance enhancement. I'm not talking about the thing that you talked about earlier. But performance enhancement, <laughs> performance <laughs> How about nitrates and things like spinach and obviously beets? Can you guys address that and talk about the performance benefits? Do you think nitrates? Or like nitrate foods, like beet juice or? I, okay, so this is gonna be purely anecdotal and I do know that some uh, science on this, um, but uh, the, the science on the whole like beet thing, which is like the nitric oxide I think that's in beets, um, is, is a little mixed. So what, what seems to be, um, the consensus of all of the current literature on this is that taking nitric oxide um, or a supplement like beet juice uh, that's very concentrated immediately before you do like a really high intensity workout, and I'm talking like, you know, one minute, two minute intervals, might, might have some beneficial effect on how fast you could run those intervals or on a cycling ergometer, some of the experiments are doing it. Um, but it, it's kind of up for up, up in the air. 
if I take uh, nitric oxide before I go for a 30 mile run, it's gonna do nothing for me from a performance perspective, according to the data, and according to the mechanism in which we think this actually works. It's really, um, it might help you at that high end, like when you're really more go going into more like anaerobic um, type of metabolism, but it's, it's not gonna help you in an ultra marathon. I have experimented with this a little bit on the track, just because it's like, I don't know, I like doing these things. Um, and uh, I have not personally found beet juice to be helpful at all, and I actually don't really like drink, I don't like beet, like, well, no, I've gotten a little more accustomed to beets. Beet juice is kind of like yucky to me, so like, I found it didn't work, and I thought it tasted yucky, so I haven't, I haven't really been using it, but, um, but really that's the only, from a performance perspective, um, what the, the strong science is really telling us at this point. But we do yeah. know, but there is no bad thing to drinking beet juice or mm -hmm. eating dark, you know, a little bit of dark chocolate or spinach, like well, other than the oxalates that I mentioned before. But if you so if you wanted to try it and you feel it does benefit, but like Jackie said, it's more for like a short burst. And nitrates um, in your blood do dilate blood vessels. Like it's been shown to reduce blood pressure and help with blood flow. So it's not going to hurt you, obviously, if you wanted to try it for sports or athletic performance. Yeah, I mean they give a um, a synthetic form to like people who are having a heart attack, right? To, like open it, like yeah. that's what they're giving to you because it's like opening your blood vessels. Yeah. Um, so, but think about that, like, do I want to take that like before I'm about to run 100 miles when I'm going to need to be running for 20 hours? Am I going to want this like boom and then like uh, I don't know? I'm a little like hesitant to experiment like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, is there one more just dying question you just want to <laughs> ask? Okay. I'm a huge dessert lover. I'm a wicked sweet tooth. So what are your go-to desserts or desserts? Dark chocolate. Dark chocolate is always the answer for I feel like, yeah. I mean, the, there's so many benefits to um, to 70% or usually 70% or higher, but cacao has got hundreds of flavonoids like phytonutrients that are beneficial for us. It's been studied so much in the literature for blood pressure, lowering cholesterol, um, making happy babies. Like literally women who are pregnant who had dark chocolate for pregnancy, like they studied babies after and they were happier. So I mean, there's some food enhancing benefits to it. So, and I feel like it just, um, it's a plant-based product and the least processed, so just look for like cacao salads, a little bit of organic cane sugar, and you don't need a lot because it is bitter, and those bitter compounds are some of the health benefits that it's providing, um, but it can help to cure your dessert cravings as well. Dark yeah. Yeah. Sugar. Oh, they might have some other options. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, medjool dates are freaking incredible. Um, uh, one of the other things that I uh, recommend for, for my clients during the transition with Sweden is making your own um, either smoothies or ice creams. You can make, make your own ice creams with bananas and strawberries, um, you know, when you fr freeze bananas. So don't be stupid like I was the first time you freeze bananas. Peel them first. <laughs> Learn from my mistake. Peel them first, then freeze them. Don't take a banana and just put it in the freezer. <laughs> and they're like, how the heck am I going to get this peel off? Okay, <laughs> so peel a banana, <laughs> put it in the freezer, and then you can make your own ice creams, and it's like really, really sweet. Or again, with smoothies, right? With berries and bananas and, 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 and greens. Um, and then, uh, you know, if, if I go to uh, Cafe Sunflower and I will have the chocolate cake from uh, Southern <laughs> Sweets. It is freaking amazing. That chocolate cake is freaking amazing. But I got I purposely limit myself to at most once a month of that because I know <laughs> Something good for soul. Huh? Right. Yeah, so, the, uh, so there are a ton of really tasty vegan treats that have a lot of processed sugar that are taste just like the actual brownie, but like our vegan brownies. But I mean, if you want to stick to like the whole food stuff, um, dates, nut butter, and cacao, and or dark chocolate, anything is freaking amazing. Like those are my good, like I have a sweet tooth too, so I, I usually eat something like that every day at some point. Um, 
And then uh, also the banana ice cream. Uh, two bananas, or what, depending on how much ice cream you want. It actually freezes well, but like two bananas, two tablespoons of tahini, um, a tablespoon or two of uh, cacao powder, and um, a date or two. It tastes like ice cream. I don't know why anyone, like I'm never eating real ice cream again because I'm literally eating bananas, but it tastes like ice cream. It's like, it, it, it's some crazy stuff that happens in a Vitamix, but like, it's like, it's natural. I'm, I'm like telling you, it is, um, there's no like, added sweetener. there's no reason, there's no added like sweetener because it's like, it's sweetened with bananas and dates, which are whole foods, grew out of the ground. So like, um, I, my sweet tooth is like totally satisfied by using a combination of mostly those type of things so and you can make any type of ice cream that you want really but that's i like the like chocolate and tahini and banana combo so that's my go-to. jakey's ice cream on the list just keep keep the blender going it looks like it's not going to work and you're like I need that milk, but don't do it just keep it going and it'll be like a soft serve and then if you want it like more hard you can put it in the freezer if you have that self-control but i usually just <laughs> <laughs> yes soft serve like chocolate Chocolate That's ice cream. Awesome. Uh, That's so, awesome. Yeah, it took me too long to figure that out too. You can like make real, real ice cream out of bananas. Yeah. Very, yeah, very important. How in the world do you keep a veggie burger together? Uh, <laughs> I started doing this back in November, and I still can't keep a veggie burger together. <laughs> Chia or flax. Um, I have a recipe I can share on my website that is like a modified recipe from the Minimal middle Baker that st stays together really well. It's um, There's walnut meal in there and I think almond flour. It just stays together and beans. Like it's, and it's so good. Um, but they stay together well. You can put them on the grill and they stay together. I can share it with you. But a lot of times chia and flax are kind of like the egg replacer that, that pulls it all together. Okay. Wrap it up. Yeah. 7.45 well, and get a little cold I know, a little I'm late. So and everybody. you're stuck with your time. Thank you so much for everybody who joined. Yeah, we'll I make know. sure to do <laughs> all of those things in the email. Party words. And um, we have a sample of a scratch bars. There are different flavors. And also a picky bars over here. That These are also vegan. So if you guys want to try it, thank, thank you, Matt, for providing this. So I yeah.